Hello, folks. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Marble Palace, Post Media Saskatchewan's look at the goings on at the Saskatchewan Legislature uh, in this, uh, well, pretty much the last week in December, I think we'll be doing it. I am Murray Mandrick. I am political columnist for the Regina Leader Post. And joining me today, Alec Salom, who has been doing a fine, fine job for the Leader Post covering this uh, session. Thanks so for joining us again, Alec. And from Canadian pre Press, uh, Mickey Drush, Drush, why do I always have trouble saying your last name? That's uh, fine. Everyone does. I just everyone I does at this point. <laughs> the point being is that Mickey uh, is the reporter for uh, Saskatchewan for Canadian Press and does a wonderful job for us uh, in terms of covering the legislature. And let's start out with Alec uh, today, if you don't mind, because there's an issue that continues to linger on uh, quite uh, 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 quite tenaciously in the legislature right now related to Bill 70 and what might be happening. There were new developments as expressed by the Premier as to what might happen now that the session, uh, or, or fall sitting I should say, is over and the session resumes in March with this bill still on the table. What did the Premier tell us yesterday, Alec? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the issue with this bill is that, as you said, it's it's lingering, but but it almost wasn't this week, and we can kind of get to that. But the premier didn't really have too too terrible many answers about this, about whether the uh, legislative protective service, whether it's going to be private or or you know publicly uh, operated, um, any further details on the structure of it, we still don't know. Um, and as to whether or not he was satisfied with the security that's currently in place at the ledge. He said that he wasn't dissatisfied, which again begs the question as to why Bill 70 is required and why it's needed. Uh, one of the interesting developments that did happen this week, though, was a few what the opposition have called shenanigans uh, that happened late on Tuesday. So we can get into a little bit of that if you're if you're interested. Uh, but from from well, a yeah, in, in, in broad strokes, what was happening? And, and I think people uh, want to get a sense of uh, what's it like inside that that place that we work sometimes and such. So tell us about how uh, it looked like uh, they were going to be there all night and per per perhaps forced to, to pass this bill for at least a brief while, I think, on Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday night. So essentially, this is some procedural nerdery. So if, if debate on a bill is not adjourned before five o'clock, the Speaker of the House has to call a recess until seven. And what we had happen was, according to uh, House Leader, Government House Leader Jeremy Harrison, was he had told uh, Vicky Mowat, Opposition House Leader, that if this discussion on Bill 70 goes past five, we're not coming back for half an hour. We're going to, you know, have a fulsome debate. And that's what happened. So um, the debate on Bill 70 went past five. Recess is called. They come back at seven. Uh, Erica Ritchie, I want to say, the NDP MLA was still speaking to it at seven, spoke for 23 additional minutes, moved for adjournment on the bill. The opposition said no, which prompted them to keep speaking about it for an additional hour and a half. So if, if they had just sat on the bill, if they hadn't continued to discuss the bill, that would have meant that it could have gone to committee, which would have effectively meant that it went to a second reading and there was no additional debate to be had on the bill at all. Big issue there is that Minister for Policing and Correction, Christine Tell, had said that this thing was just going to be where it's at until April, which is when this thing is meant to be voted and come into force. So there was a real possibility this week that this bill could have gone further, could have gone out of discussion and could have gone to committee which is, is, you know, again, yeah. it's procedural nerdery and they would have been within their right to yeah. do that. But given the optics around this, given what it's proposing to do, and given what uh, Nicole Sarr, at least, uh, justice critic for the NDP said, it, it was a little bit what they said, punishment, because Minister Harrison had said, like, again, if we're coming back to discuss this, we're not gonna just be here for, for 30 minutes, we're gonna have a debate on this, and it ended up going until nine. They didn't need to do that. They could have yep. held off, adjourned, and you know, called it a night. But debate went until nine, almost nine thirty that night. So Sarah had kind of described it as punishment because she felt as though uh, Minister Harrison was upset that debate wasn't wrapped. There's a lot of questions as to his involvement within the bill. Uh, opposition has claimed that he's the architect of the bill. He says absolutely, I'm not. It's Minister Tell's bill. And there's this back and forth within the 
parties about what's even going on and why it's come forward. Yeah, and that's a critical issue, right? Because mm -hmm. all the political gamesmanship aside, in play are some pretty important things. Who gets to control security, not just in the legislature beyond the chamber, but around the building, which is yeah. a big issue these days, or so we're told, except we're, ne we're still not getting any exa examples why. Mm -hmm. Problem being right now is that if there is problems related to who could, gets to control security and everything else, now's the time to sort them out, to, to bring them together in this period in which there's a reprieve uh, between house sittings and allow them to basically uh, sort out some of those problems. And the sense that I think that we got from the premier this week is that while there is that period that one can bring forward whatever complaints um, there might be about Bill 70, the government's willingness to listen to those complaints and perhaps make changes might not be that great. And that, mm -hmm. was that sort of the general impression from the premier this week? That I, at least that's what I got. So. Yeah, absolutely. It, did, it didn't seem like there was much of a olive branch, so to speak, offered to the opposition when it came to further discussing, amending, changing Bill 70. I mean, obviously, the opposition has been pretty stalwart in their want and desire for this bill to be pulled out, right? But it didn't seem like there was going to be any kind of, you know, meeting during this uh, session or during this period between uh, question periods and between sittings didn't really seem like there was going to be too, too terrible much discussed or, or you know, done on this bill, as it were. So it seems like it's just going to be held at the moment, and it'll be back up for discussion uh, come March when the sitting like resumes. What, what drives me nuts, having been around uh, this that building way too long, is that you get bogged down, stuck in these political games that go back and forth that matter not to anyone in terms of how they really affect people. Whereas there's real stuff happening that we don't hear much about, and it comes down maybe once or twice a year in the form of the provincial auditor's report, where they delve into very serious issues and detailed issues that probably don't get nearly as much attention as uh, uh, you know, a silly political scrap over whether we should sit or not and say nothing about a bill that, and have a, a debate that means nothing. So let's move forward, Mickey, if we can, to what the provincial auditor offered in her uh, fall report this year, and specifically a story that you did that's a, a fascination to me is the problems in Saskatchewan group homes, because this has been such a big, important issue to the SAS party. Uh, uh, that would start uh, that uh, that from from the start from its very start. So, but let's begin with in general. What were the issues uh, that were interesting in the provincial uh, auditor's fall report? And can you describe what she had to say about the conditions in uh, Saskatchewan group homes? Yeah, there was. I mean, there was a lot to unpack in that uh, auditor's report. I think us journalists are still going through it and. It was almost like a silver platter of uh, issues that the government has to resolve. Um, but some of them obviously including regulating, they need the government needs to do better regulating um, cigarettes and vaping, making sure they're not in the hands of children. Um, you know, we gotta have better measures regarding cybersecurity. And then the topic that obviously that I found most interesting um, was these group homes for intellectually disabled, uh, which the auditor analyzed uh, these group homes, which are publicly funded, but they are private group homes, privately operated, and they house about 1,600 residents. And what the auditor found that out of 1,600 residents that, you know, are living in these private homes, more than 800 residents have faced a serious incident. And it ranges from mismanagement of medicine, either them getting too many doses or them not getting their medicine at all. Um, it ranges from people wandering off or, or getting lost. Um, one person got uh, hot water doused on them. And what was so interesting um, with this story for me is that I spent so many years in Moose Jaw and um, the government uh, operated a facility there for intellectual uh, people with intellectual disabilities uh, at Valley View Center in Moose Jaw. And they decided to shut it down in 2019 and this was a huge like topic of debate in the community because they were really worried about what's going to happen to these individuals once you move them from a facility into these 
um, private group homes in the community. And at that time in 2019, the government said that they're committed to, uh, I quote, a Saskatchewan made person centered approach um, to shape, you know, these residents dreams and aspirations. And like, for example, so if they wanted to take part in certain activities or have specific goals, the homes are there to help them. And so this model was Praise. They shut down Valley View Center in Moose Jaw in 2019, which resulted in moving 150 residents into the community. But what the auditor's report found is that many of these people um, with intellectual disabilities who are living in these private group homes did not get that Saskatchewan made person centered approach. And in a lot of times, the government has not followed up on any of these plans for these residents and they don't meet the expectations. They did. Um, a sample of certain reports, they just, you know, pulled, I, I can't remember, but a couple dozen, and they found about 70% of the plans for these individuals did not meet expectations. Um, and the ministry also, uh, and the auditor also found out that the ministry did had no direct contact with about 63% of residents in these private group homes in the past two years. And Minister Carr attributed that and a lot of the issues that these homes are facing to COVID-19. A, a, a little bit of fascinating background to me, because um, sadly I've been around here a little bit longer uh, and, and have seen this this story play out. But the passion the Sask Party had as government for this issue early on in its tenure was always a source of fascination to me, because they're a conservative-minded government, and you never think social issues. Uh, are their particular strength. But in this particular case, they it was. It was back in 2007 and 2011 after their first term in government, where they promised, as you described, to ensure that no person in Saskatchewan wouldn't have uh, uh, or, or would be left out of a of a facility, a nice home to live in. There, there would be an ability for people to live in a home setting as opposed to one that was more institutionalized, which is, I think, what you're talking about in terms of moving away from the Valley View model and the other more institutionalized models that we used to have in the province in terms of group homes. This was a severe commitment and a, and a huge financial one. At, at the time, the program that they set forth uh, more than 10 years ago was a $63 million program, which is a big commitment to a relatively small number of people. But they felt it important, and so did other people. Uh, and parents of uh, adult uh, people with intellectual disabilities were very disheartened by the, in, the previous NEP government's inability to deal with this issue. So my point being, is that this has always been the SAS party's baby, their issue, something that they're very passionate about. And I was in the same scrum with Ms. Carr, uh, the social services minister, Lori Carr. And while she did answer our questions, and I, I think while I think it's it fair to say that she uh, expressed concern and care about this issue, what I didn't hear is someone long in the tooth is the same passion uh, I've heard from previous social ministers, be they Donna Harpower, who was the first social minister, June Drowdy, who was the minister who piloted this through her, or Tina Baudry Millar, who was the more recent social services minister before the election. Uh, I didn't hear the same passion for this issue as I've heard in the past. Can you just somewhat describe um, Ms. Carr's response to this particular issue? And I guess maybe specifically her response in terms of what her department and government tend to want to do to fix the problems and how, how they're going to move forward from here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, in the scrum, it was, uh, you know, uh, a, a bit unusual in the sense that she kept attributing all these 800 deaths, or sorry, not deaths. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. These 800 serious incidents, there's no deaths. There was yeah. no deaths. Uh, these 800 serious incidences to COVID-19, um, but then following the scrum, uh, her communication staff was quick to clear up that no half of these serious incidents are not related to COVID-19. What they were, what, they said Carr was referring to is that serious incidents have increased 12% since the previous year, and about half of that 12% is attributed to COVID-19 related incidents. For example, there's 58 COVID-19 outbreaks in 12 private group homes. 
Um, so uh, that's what they were quick to clarify. Um, the minister did say that she will accept the auditor's recommendations, which includes, you know, having a, a thorough um, review of these homes and having better processes in place um, to ensure that are there any, you know, maybe patterns in these um, homes that are providing services? Are these serious incidences, you know, a trend? Does this need to be addressed? Um, so the government has said they are going to be looking into this and following up and, and taking the recommendations. I asked if the government's going to do anything further beyond the recommendations, and they said no, um, not at this time. And then I also asked, um, you know, if they're going to be reviewing um, any of the contracts with these private group homes. And they said, no, if, if they, um, not at this time, that, it, you know, if they feel like anyone was unsafe at these group homes, that they would have no problem shutting them down um, as Sorry. they have in the past. Um, but I think, you know, for me, what was so interesting is that, you know, these private group homes that, ha, you know, are in charge of these in intellectually disabled individuals, they receive the majority of the Ministry of Social Services funding. So the Ministry of Social Services funding is 174 million and these private group homes get about $111 million. And despite that, we still have half of the intellectually disabled residents experiencing a serious event, according to the auditor. And actually social services critic Mira Conway was saying, you know, that we're seeing spending increase across the board and yet we're seeing worse outcomes. And she said, if this doesn't upset people um, socially, it should upset them fiscally. And, you know, that's why I addressed my question to um, Minister Carr about, you know, are they going to review any contracts? Is, is there anything they need to do um, to maybe better manage the money and, and get the outcomes that we receive? But it doesn't look like at this time um, that's on the table. It, it was a fascinating uh, uh, story, and I wish we had actually more time to talk about in, in detail, but I'm glad we were able to spend as much time on it as we can. As I guess we wrap up, let, let, let's wrap up uh, the session in broader terms, because I think for both of you, this was the first session you got to cover, uh, right, if, I'm, if, I, if, I, if I remember correctly. Uh, Alec, for you, beyond Bill 70, beyond what we talked about in terms of the auditor's report, what struck you as kind of the most interesting thing about covering uh, uh, the fall sitting? Yeah, I, I, covering the last three weeks of it, I mean, there was a lot that happened, right? I mean, that was when we had the media financial report, auditor's report, as, as Mickey had gone into great mm -hmm. detail on, uh, the letter from uh, Minister, I want to say, Oh, it was the letter to uh, APAS and then the from uh, Mr. Back. Merritt and, and Mr. Harpower. Yeah. And then also the uh, letters from Dustin Duncan as well. I mean, to, to various school divisions. I mean, there's there's so much that happened and there's a number of just head scratching moments that kind of come out of it that trying to pinpoint one specifically, I'm having a little bit of trouble. But I think that what was really interesting about the back and forth with uh, APAS and the government was that, like these, th this is a historic base for the SAS parties, farmers, yeah. right? And it seems as though through what they characterize as some clunky language and some messaging issues, that they seem to have alienated a fair few number of farmers and have certainly irked a fair few number of farmers. And it's just going to be interesting to see what that looks like because again, this comes out of the record payments from crop insurance, right? It comes from the drought year that we had. And granted that there's snow on the ground right now, I think that we're all kind of holding our breath and waiting to see what the coming year will look like with respect to agricultural outlooks, with respect to moisture levels across the province. So that's one thing that really stood out to me is that when it comes down to why we had this record payout, I didn't hear a whole heck of a lot with concern to contingency plans for it happening again, outside of historically, we don't have two years. Two droughts in a row, yeah. Yeah. And and that's that's one of the things that really, really stood out to me is that, again, as, as the government said, you know, this was over uh, 2.4, I want to say, billion uh, payout from uh, crop insurance. Mm -hmm. Be interesting to see what the next year looks like. And I know that Minister Harpower in her role as finance minister has frequently said that the thing that keep her up at night are, are natural disasters, uh, droughts, issues like that. And unfortunately- Floods, fire, and drought. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And unfortunately- nature of the beast right now is that it seems that we have a lot more of all of those. 
So yeah. that's probably what stood out most to me. And that's the one thing that I found to be incredibly interesting. Again, outside of yeah. Bill 70, the procedural nerdery and the weirdness behind that, Bill. Mickey, as we wrap this up, uh, is there one particular story that you did this session beyond what we talked about and what Al raised that, that kind of stood out to you as, as holy cow, this this tells me something about this government or this this got a reaction that I wasn't sort of anticipating? I mean, yeah, there was a lot. I want to kind of do it in point four, but, you know, they did pass the bills um, regarding the bubble zones around um, yep, schools and hospitals uh, regarding COVID-19. Um, another issue that I found was very important um, regarding bills that did pass is that uh, they changed the labor laws to include sexual harassment in oh &S policy, which protects not only uh, women in the workplace, but protects, you know, contract workers, models, artists. This is something mm -hmm. that women um, in this province have been pushing for for many years. And, and for them to see that, that was that was wonderful for them. Um, I think what was interesting about this session is that it started when we were still kind of near you know, are not near our peak of the the fourth wave, but we are just kind of starting to come down our peak. And at that time, um, in late October, we still didn't have any answers regarding when our healthcare workers getting redeployed, when's our surgeries um, coming back. And now we kind of have at least a plan and target dates from the government. And I think a lot of that had to do with the NDP, um, bringing in a lot of patients who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of canceled services. Um, but honestly, one of the, the things that stood out to me the most was um, the government uh, unanimously, all members voting to change the uh, Canadian Constitution as it relates. Oh to yeah, Canada. good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to remove that clause, um, essentially exempting CP Rail from paying taxes in the province, and they passed that motion unanimously, and that. Uh, now is in the House of Commons on the floor there in in Parliament, but I was just you know nerding out a little bit with the mm -hmm. Minister of Justice over it. We were talking about how cool it was because in in none of our lifetimes anyone has been able to do this. So it's pretty fascinating um, on the history side of things. And but I also think even yesterday when the session wrapped up. Um, you know, what stood out to me a little bit, it was it was almost like a weird feeling in the rotunda because we had, you know, we just left the chambers where, you know, it left on a positive note, everyone have a Merry Christmas, have a wonderful, you know, season, holiday season with family and friends. And there was kind of that elephant in the room of, you know, well, we have 900 deaths in this province from COVID-19. People are still being impacted. This is not a happy holiday season for many families, including Eden, who is waiting a transplant, who also visited the rotunda uh, yesterday and spoke to media about how she's still being affected from the fourth wave and her saying that she doesn't have a home for Christmas and she's going to be spending Christmas decorating her locker uh, at Wascana Rehabilitation Center, um, likely without family around because of the pandemic. So while it did end on this traditional happy note of Merry Christmas, you know, there's still issues that this government uh, needs to address uh, despite the fall sitting uh, ending. It, it was a great reminder that place, regardless of the political games we talked about today, regardless of everything else that goes uh, on in terms of bigger issues or smaller ones, it's still about very serious things and about people. And it's always important to uh, to remember that. And, and you two in your work this session and your work always do an excellent job of bringing it back to the stories being about people, about pe real issues and about real things. Uh, Alec, Mickey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your good work during this session. Uh, have a Merry Christmas, and hopefully we'll see you soon on Inside the Marble Palace, but we'll see you soon at the legislature where, we, uh, where, where uh, we'll keep seeing good work from you inside and outside the legislature. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.